Good evening, saints and friends. My name is Sister Bernadette Stainrod, and welcome to another Wednesday night Bible study with the Macedonia Church family here in North Connecticut. Our pastor is uh, Brandon Davis, and we welcome you to another Wednesday night Bible study. It's a beautiful day, and I just hope that uh, you had a great day, and I hope you had time to study this wonderful lesson as we conclude this week in the book of Ruth. Um, let's go look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give you praise tonight. We give you the glory. We give you the honor for this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. God, we thank you for another opportunity just to come together and study your word. It's a rich lesson and I know the saints were blessed. God, continue to have your way tonight as we go forward in this lesson. Open up our minds, Lord. Open up our spirit. There's so much you want to give us tonight. So much we uh, you want to impart into our spirit, single and married alike. God, just have your way tonight. And we pray especially for the family of Michael Hodge, Lord. We pray that you wrap your loving arms around them. You wrap your arms of strength around them, Lord, and his parents and his sisters and his brothers, Lord. Wrap your arms around them. Give them strength in this difficult hour, Lord. And let good come out of this pain, Lord. Let good come out of this pain for your glory and your honor. And God, we pray for those who are sick and infirmed. And, and um, God, we pray tonight you send forth a healing. Let your healing virtue flow as many may listen tonight. Lord, you comfort them. You touch them. Strengthen their bodies. And God, just have your way. And we give you the praise tonight. We give you the glory. And we give you the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. This week, we will conclude the book of Ruth, and our lesson text will challenge us to obey God from the heart and will give us a clear picture of the redeeming work of Christ. And it's it's a powerful, we, there are only four chapters in Ruth, but we had, this is our third lesson, but it's a powerful, powerful book in such short um, four chapters. And last week we had a beautiful lesson and this week we will conclude. But um, as it was said in previous lessons, Ruth is not just a, a love story. You know, it's a beautiful love story of those who contemplating marriage and the characteristics of what a, 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 a virtuous wife or woman should be and a godly man of God. And it's all of those and, and above. Uh, um, but there's more to Ruth. There's more to the book of Ruth than just a lovely story for married couples. But honestly, I was so blessed uh, studying this lesson. It's a rich, rich lesson. We saw how God rewarded Ruth's decision to follow him. She entered into a personal relationship with a personal God who provided for her through Boaz and made her a part of his community. And we will see in this lesson how it's a lesson about drawing closer to the Lord, a lesson of intimacy, a lesson of redemption. And it's such a rich, rich, we got spiritual nuggets out of this lesson. And as it was said last week, you know, even studying it, there's just more and more to be gleaned. Um, real quickly, does anybody want to quickly give us a recap of last week's lesson? Briefly. Anybody would like to um, um, say what you got out of, out of last week's lesson? Sister Kawana, thank you. Um, yes, last week our lesson was Ruth meeting Boaz um, and kind of even just going back to the lesson before that, that's when we met Ruth and her mother-in-law and, um, and, and, and they, they suffered great tragedy being in Moab. Then they came back home. Um, the town was excited to see Naomi knowing that Ruth came with them um, and her reputation preceded her. We talked a lot about Ruth's character. Um, and when she went to meet Boaz, it was a, um, a, a God, a meeting that was uh, organized and orchestrated by God himself um, because Ruth just being a foreigner, um, you know, went into the field to glean. Um, she didn't know whose field she was at. She went to the field to glean. She met Boaz there. Boaz um, is a godly man. He's a, you know, a God-fearing man. He's a good man. He was so kind and generous to her. 
Um, he gave her more and, you know, blessings that she did not expect. Um, but, but through it all, Ruth never, um, she was very humble. She never got prideful or anything like that. But, um, but yeah, that was uh, pretty much the lesson last week of her meeting Boaz and us discussing their characters and just how God will take care of his people. Amen. Thank you. That was beautiful, Sister Kawana. And then we will see how the uh, comparison between Boaz and uh, our Jesus, who's our Kingsman Redeemer. I am honestly, I really enjoyed studying this lesson. Note, keep in mind the events described in the book of Ruth, in the book of Ruth, took place in the days when the judges ruled. This was a period of great apostasy in Israel when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Yet in the midst of a dark period of history, Boaz stands out as a godly man in an ungodly time. He stood out as a man of integrity. Boaz showed compassion for the poor, and needy by opening his fields to gleaners, as Sister Kawana said, as the law instructed. We, we find that Boaz followed the law to the best of his ability. In particular, he demonstrated loving concern for the young widow, Ruth, who had left her homeland to accompany Naomi back to Bethlehem. He had even allowed her to work alongside his workers in the field and he had fed her as he had his hired servants. Boaz's concern for Ruth and his obedience in God, to God's law are seen in one final incident in Ruth, in Ruth chapter four. My accent, my Jamaican accent's coming out in Ruth chapter four. So just for introduction in the lesson, Sister Amanda Brown will read this for us. Life is full of rules, duties, and obligations, but we should not assume that we have met God's standard when we conform to the bare minimum of these requirements. Certain situations require much more of us, and the difficulty of those situations does not excuse us from doing what is right. Wow, let's still up on that for a moment. My goodness, amen. Next slide, please. As Christians, we are called to obey God, God's will, even when it seems like it's more than we can handle. In our lesson this week, we will learn about Boaz, who not only redeemed Naomi's property, but also married Ruth. Also married Ruth. But as Christians, we are called to obey God's will, even when it seems like more than we can handle. And uh, that's a mouthful right there in itself, that it's like we're living in faith. You know, we, we have to live to do the will of God, not our will, but thy will be done, Lord. Because in ourselves, we can do nothing, but there are times that God calls us to do things that the flesh doesn't want to do. But because we love God, we aim to please him. And we see in this lesson, Boab, I'm sorry, Boaz was a man of God. He loved God and he aimed to please his father. So today's aim, the facts, to learn how Boaz took over the task of a family redeemer when the first man would not do the job. Very important. The principle to show that God requires obedience from the heart, not merely from a sense of duty. And we want to apply uh, to this lesson. When we uh, leave this lesson, this is the application we want to take with us to teach that sometimes what is required of us may go, may go beyond what seems possible. But we know that what's uh, uh, impossible for man is very much possible for God, but that we should step forward in obedience and do it. It's not easy but because we love the Lord, we will step forward in obedience and do the will of God. And we're looking at these um, Ruth chapter four, verses one through six, Boaz proposition, uh, looking at verses uh, seven through 10, Boaz acquisition. So for a quick minute, 
um, well, a couple of minutes, this video, I just love this video. And I'm like, I'm like Sister Merle. Sometimes we have to let the children teach us. You know, they simplify it and it's just, you can retain it when it's so simple. So I would like to play this video and it's simple, but it really, it's in depth. <laughs> Ruth's Redeemer In the days when Israel was ruled by judges, there was a young woman named Ruth. And she lived in a country called Moab. Moab? Yep, it was right next to Israel. So they were like neighbors. Right. Now, Ruth was married to a man named Malan who had a brother named Killian, who married a woman named Orpah. Malan and Killian were the sons of Naomi and Elimelech. Kili, uh, Eli, Elim, uh, okay. Those names are really hard to say. They are. People had very interesting names back then. But those names aren't the hardest part of this story. Oh no! Is the story sad? It starts out that way. Oh. Before they were married, Malin and Killian were living in Moab with their mom and dad because there was a famine in Israel. Do you know what that is? Oh yeah! A famine is when there isn't enough food. Right. And that's where the story gets sad. What happened? After they moved to Moab, Elimelech died. That's so sad. Yes, it is. But then, something even sadder happened. What was it? A little while after they married Ruth and Orpah, Malin and Killian died too. Oh no! So Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth were left all alone? Right. What did they do? Naomi was very sad, and she decided I have no sons, and I'm too old to work, so I better go back to Israel, where I'm from. But you, Orpah and Ruth, stay here in Moab, where you have family and friends. So Naomi said a teary goodbye to Orpah and Ruth, and started her journey. But soon after, she realized that Ruth was following her. What are you doing? I'm going to Israel with you. With me? Why? You're my mother-in-law, and I love you. I want to make sure you're going to be okay. But what about your family? I will love your family like my own, and I will love your God. That is so amazing! Ruth was willing to give up everything for Naomi. That's right! God really loves it when we show love like that. Oh, thank you, Ruth. So off they went. Together. Yes, and when they were in Israel, they met a man named Boaz. Boaz had a nice house and a lot of land and plenty of food. And I love God. Yes, Boaz loved God. Boaz heard how Ruth had left her family and country to take care of Naomi. So, Boaz decided he should help them. That is so nice! How did he help? Well, first Boaz let Ruth pick food from his fields for free, so that she and Naomi would have plenty to eat. Wow! Not only that, Boaz offered to make Ruth his wife, so she could have a home and family again. Double wow! And that's not all that Boaz did for them. What? What else did he do? He redeemed the land that used to belong to Naomi and her husband. Redeemed? What does that mean? Redeem means to buy back, to pay the price so something or someone can be free. So, Boaz bought back the land that used to belong to Naomi. And gave it to her as a present. I love this! The story of Ruth and Naomi reminds us about God's rescue plan. 
Just like Boaz had to pay a price to redeem Naomi's land, many years later, someone would be born in Ruth's family who would pay the price to redeem the whole world from sin. Wait a minute. Do you mean Jesus? That's right. Jesus, our Redeemer. Did you? Amen. That was so beautiful. Any comments? Learned a lot from that. Any comments? Okay, so we're going to go right into the lesson. It, it really summarized the whole book of Ruth um, from chapters one through four. And as I was saying, as we as we um, dig into this lesson, keep in mind, though, you know, as we were saying, it's it is a love story. And I thank God even I must say this. Um, 38 years ago, God sent me my Boaz. So I thank God for that. Leroy Stanron, for 38 years, we've been married. God's been keeping us. So I thank God he's, he's a godly man. I love him. And I, I, I believe he loves me too, you know, but God has been keeping us. But the story of Ruth is more than that. You know, we'll see, um, you know, talks about the, the redeemer, the Kingsman redeemer, the characteristics, you know, how Jesus loves us in, in the midst of, um, our uh, weakness and in the midst of our deficiencies, you know, how God just really reached out to us, picked us up out of sin and, and loved us. So this week's lesson, though, is coming from Ruth, the fourth chapter, but we must fill in the blanks. Um, last week, we um, left off in chapter two and uh, Boaz meeting or Ruth meeting Boaz. And this week, um, we find Boaz, Ruth marrying Boaz. So we have to fill in the gaps. So what event, what happened in Ruth 3 that set up the events of chapter 4? We'll read the lesson I, in a but I just wanted to fill in the gaps um, in chapter 3 before we read the, the lesson text. So I did not forget. Thank you. Sister Amanda Brown. Thank you, Sister Bernadette. Um, there was a uh, event that took place. There was um, a harvesting, like say party, and Naomi encouraged Ruth to go to this party and do some specific things so that she could get the attention of Boaz, but very discreetly. Um, should I continue or just- Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Please. So one of the things um, that no Naomi did is she explained to her what what she should do that Ruth when she got to the um event she is to wait and and to find out where Boaz is going to be and then keep it to herself and then when everybody kind of dissipates and after Boaz has had a couple of drinks now she did say it she <laughs> says when it gets late you go and you lay yourself at his feet and then cover yourself with his blanket and then let him tell you what he's going to do now, just because you said you want to keep it spiritual, even though I think in this day and time when people have no idea what marriage is um, and how they're messing it all up, this is like exactly what God meant. I will say that in this instance, Naomi was acting like the Holy Ghost and she was pushing Ruth towards Jesus's feet so that we could um, get covered and, and be redeemed by him. And then I'll be quiet. Amen. That was excellent. And then you also led us to where I wanted to go, but that, that's excellent. We're going to go right back there. Anybody else? Now, I know in this story, some people are uncomfortable, you know, maybe some men are uncomfortable that, you know, because they like to be, you know, the initiators and, you know, here Ruth came, you know, was like, I'm interested, but keep in mind that uh, Boaz was older and we don't know the reasons why he remained. He wasn't sing, uh, remained single. Maybe his previous wife had died. We don't know. Um, but you remember Ruth was younger and Boaz was an older gentleman. So he might not have thought she was interested, you know, so I, I love what sister Amanda said, you know, how um, Naomi acted like the Holy Ghost, you know, and gave him a little nudge. And sometimes these men have to have a little nudge, <laughs> you know, but I love um, Ruth's meek and quiet spirit. You know, she didn't go forceful and she did exactly what Ni Naomi told her to do. Any other comments? Uh, sister uh, Kawana. Um, yeah, also, and I love sister Amanda's comments too, but um also i love that naomi um you know she she acted as the holy ghost but i also love just from a natural perspective that this is an older wo woman kind of teaching a younger woman of like how to 
how to catch a man basically <laughs> um you know in a good way um mm -hmm. so so i love that as well and also in chapter three um i think ruth and naomi learned something that boaz wasn't actually their nearest kinsman okay don't um, jump ahead oh, we're gonna okay, go sorry. there in one second sorry about that yep <laughs> but, all right no 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 problem but thank you that was powerful but i love your comment sister kawana how that's why you know paul told the older women to teach the younger women you know how to be submissive how to be keepers at home but I love both your comments, and um, the, 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 I'll just say this: what in um, what Sister Koana was saying, how Naomi told her, you know, dress yourself, smell good, you know, and and not to entice him, you know, but to keep your appearance up. Like, you know, it is you don't have to be the prettiest woman. You don't have to, you know. Uh, be the uh, number 10, you know, but work with what you have, you know, not in a Tyson way, but just, you know, work with what you have and keep your appearance up and smell good and look good and, and do all that you can, you know. Um, Sister Sandra and Sister Nicole. I always um, think about this scripture as uh, when I think about Sister Addie, my mother in the gospel, most of our mother in the gospel, and how, you know, she taught us among other, you know, uh, women as well, how to be that virtuous woman, how to, you know, um, get a husband, you know, the single sisters and whatnot. So I've always thought about her when I read this um, scripture. Amen. That's beautiful, Sister Sandra. Give an honor to whom honors due. Um, Sister Nicole. I love Ruth um, because it shows the importance of obedience and um, listening to the wise. Like, I'm thinking about my mom, how she always gives me advice and counsel. And it's very important because had she not listened to Naomi, she could have missed her man and her blessing. So it shows the very, the importance of being obedient. Excellent comments. I love all these comments, my goodness. So as it was said, chapter three describes what happened between Boaz and Ruth that led to his pursuit of becoming her permanent protector and husband. Naomi had shown Ruth how to indicate to Boaz that she desired this relationship. And um, Sister Koana will read these verses for us, Ruth 3, 1 through 5. There's a couple of points. Like, I, like as I was saying, this lesson is so rich. And even what I was saying, even um, me, Mary, and Leroy, that's a story to be told, but, you know, not tonight, you know, like, there, there's so many facets to this, the, to the book of Ruth, and we can't cover it all tonight. So we're going to do the best we can in the time frame. But it's so rich, so rich with spiritual truths and nuggets. Sister Kawana, please read for us. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Could you stop right there for me, please? I highlighted the word rest. My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And I wanted to interject this point right here. Naomi's desire for her daughter-in-law, both of them, were for them to find rest. And reflecting back also to Ruth 1 and 9, she said, the Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. It was her prayer then in chapter one, and it was still her desire now in chapter three. The word rest, a true marriage relationship should produce a place of rest. I really wanted to emphasize that. It should produce a place of rest for both wife and husband. It shouldn't be a place of turmoil. It shouldn't be a place of abuse. It shouldn't be a place where the spouse is fretting to come home because of the turmoil. That's not this Christian home. I'm, I'm talking about a Christian uh, a marriage relationship. It should be a place of rest for both husband and wife. And I wanted to say one of the strongest, and men, hear me tonight, please, one of the strongest desire a woman has, a wife has, is to be a place of security and trust. I had to interject that. She has to be able to trust her husband. You know, I'm teaching the lesson I'm a woman, but it, it, we need a marriage seminar to, to cover both sides. But I can only speak 
coming from a woman. It should be a place where she finds security, not a place of a, abuse, not where the husband is cheating on her, not and vice versa. We have women cheating now too, you know. So this goes for both men and women, but that place should be a place of rest, a place of security. And I had to interject that. Uh, I'll let continue uh have Kawana read in a minute. Um, oh, go ahead, Kawana. You could continue reading. Uh, and now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And, oh, sorry. Nope. <laughs> and she said unto her, all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And, and like what Sister Nicole said, all that she said unto her, all that thou sayest unto me. I will do. She was totally obedient to Naomi. Another point I would like to make, we're just filling in the gaps a little bit, is that we should note that this text, and I love what Sister Amanda Brown said, illustrates the deepening relationship with the Lord. We have to highlight that point. It illustrates the believer's deepening relationship with the Lord. Sometimes people shy away from this book because they think it's just a love story. It is a love story, but it's not just between a man and a woman. It's a, to draw closer to the Lord. It's to get an intimacy with the Lord. Boaz is portrayed as a type of Christ, a kinsman redeemer. We're going to go more into that. But also we know Jesus is our true redeemer, a true king, uh, kingsman redeemer, and he's greater than Boaz. In chapter one, Ruth doesn't know Boaz. I'm showing you the intimacy as we're drawn closer to the Lord and just, just paralyze, uh, parallel this to our walk with the Lord. Ruth doesn't know Boaz. Chapter two, she's poor laborer, gleaning in the field and receiving gifts and benefits. She's receiving gifts and benefits from Boaz. We're receiving gifts and benefits from the Lord. But chapter three is the turning point where here she yields to the will of the Lord. All that thou sayest, I will do. She yields to the will of the Lord. And we find her in humble submission at the feet of Boaz and believing in, and believing in his promises. And in chapter four, she's no longer a poor gleaner, but she emerges as Boaz's glorious bride, the bride of Christ. And everything he owns, everything Boaz owns, everything Christ owns now belongs to his bride. So powerful. I read this in the commentary. It says, too many of God's people are content to live in chapter two picking up the leftovers and doing the best they can in their difficult situation. They want God's gifts, but they don't want a deeper communion, communion with God. What a difference it would make if they would only surrender themselves to the Lord and focus on the giver instead of the gifts. Silla, my goodness. And the Bible said, Ruth went down onto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. Any comments? So this ties right into what Sister Amanda Brown was saying. It's just, you see the progression of how the, you know, she got closer and closer to Boaz and then laying at his feet, the intimacy we are to have with Christ. Any comments? Amen. Uh, Elder Leroy. Yeah, I was saying it, it's important that Ruth also followed our mother-in-law's instruction because she was also from another culture. And, um, you know, there are customs that sometimes each cultures have, you know, the Indian, they have a lot of cultures and whatever. So if you, as an outsider, you know, come in not knowing the customs and whatever, and you could violate it, which could be a big turnoff for the, um, 
you know, the people that you're around. So that's what was, it was very important for her to follow because she doesn't know the ways of Israel, even though we know God was leading her in, in her instruction. But, you know, it was important that she follow because she could have done something wrong, which could be, could be a big turnoff for Boaz and the people around her. That's an excellent point. You know, she could have violated um, and if this story could have turned another way. That's an excellent point. Anybody else want to add to that point? What could have happened if Ruth had gone in and just told Boaz what her tension, intentions were? What do you think would have happened had she done that? Uh, Deacon uh, Gideons. On you, please. Yes, um, I think he probably would have been kind of standoffish um, because he wasn't making that really available. It wasn't really told in the third chapter. I mean, I know it was told that he might have had some interest in protecting her integrity as a woman as she gleamed and the young men shouldn't bother her. And I know he served her, but it was never made known to us that he was really interested in her. And I think he knew that he wasn't the first kinsman redeemer for her also so he had to kind of play in the background so i think he would have been standoffish and almost um uh told her that she really needs to talk to the other kinsman redeemer oh. first excellent excellent we're going to touch on that brother um ashton no uh, deacon sean uh said exactly what i want to say you know and then ruth um, what Nicole was saying that it was important that she was so obedient um, to Naomi, but um, Ruth, you know, probably uh, by this time, maybe knew of the law, maybe Naomi told her, you know, of the laws and different things like that, that she could have a foot in with Boaz, but she herself could have approached him in a more haughty fashion. You know, we are we see her went with submission and you know, you know, put your mantle over me. And she could have been saying, Listen, you know, I'm next in line and like forceful. And as everyone said, it would have really been a turnoff. And that's its even characteristics that as women, you know, we should really even glean from this story that men don't like aggressive women, you know, to be in their face and things like that. It's it's very important that. You know, we all, we keep a meek and quiet spirit and men, most men don't like aggressive women and forceful women to be in their face and to be, you know, coming on to them. So any other comments? Sister Shirley? Yes, I just wanted to also add that um, it, it would have been a disaster for her because women, according to what the scripture says, that women weren't allowed on the the floor on the threshing floor so you know she it would have been it could have been dangerous for her amen amen okay thank you all for your comments if nobody else likes to go we're going to move on so in looking at Ruth three and nine what was ruth's appeal to boaz i gave you a hint what was ruth's appeal to boaz Any hands? It's right there. <laughs> I'm looking for the name. Okay. Any hands? And she said, I am Ruth thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near of near kingsman. She was looking for a kingsman, kingsman redeemer. Back in. Uh, who is that? Kingsman Redeemer. Ruth's appeal was for Boaz to become her. Please, okay, please, okay, her Kingsman Redeemer. So let's look. Um, last week, since the Kawana talked about a Kingsman Redeemer, does anybody remember what she said from last week? What is a Kingsman Redeemer? Any hands? Kingsman Redeemer. What did she say a Kingsman Redeemer was? Who we have not heard from. Okay, we have 63 people online. Somebody knows what a Kingsman Redeemer is. Anything you could remember? Sister Shirley Williams. Um, I believe it has something to do with a relative of a male, the responsibility of it. 
I'm going a relative. To, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I can barely to. hear you. Oh, let me turn that volume. Look, Sister Amanda Davis. It was basically what Boaz was. He helped um, her because she was in need. Amen. Someone in need, Sister Shirley, I did hear her say a male, uh, uh, and to help someone who's in need. A male relative. A male relative. Very good. These are very good points. Anybody else? Uh, sis, Brother Ashton, Sister Merle. Someone who rescues. Very good. Someone who rescues. Um, and Sister Merle. Um, I, it was like a near, a relative, a near kinsman who was related to the husband and would come alongside because the husband was dead now and would be able to buy back the property so that the widow, whoever the widow was, she would again then have access to the property of her husband that she otherwise would not have had access to. Very good, very good. Uh, Sister Amanda, you wanted to say something else? No, Sister Mo said it. Okay, thank you. Sister Sharon? Um, I was just going to say that um, Leviticus uh, chapter 25, verses 23 to 28 explains um, exactly what a, a kinsman um, is and what their their position, uh, how they are to um, come into um, a situation in one, like people have mentioned, rescue, help to obtain either property or things that, that were lost by a uh, a relative before them they are basically um identified as you know the the person who is able to come in and get back whatever property or things that were that were lost in however by the by their previous relatives amen thank you and I, I, the reason why i'm staying a little long on this because this is what the book of ruth is about you know jesus how we see Jesus as our Kingsman Redeemer. You know, the fact of the matter is that every single page of the Bible is, is, is whether it's in the Old Testament foreshadows who Christ is or in the New Testament, it's a fulfillment of Christ's, uh, of, uh, um, Christ's role in the New Testament. It, Old Testament is sealed and New Testament's revealed. So every page in the Bible is, te is technically about Christ. And so this is really what the book of Ruth is. And just all the adjectives and descriptions that you have mentioned about the Kingsman Redeemer, that's who Christ is to us. Um, Sister Alma, Sister Nicole, and we'll move on. Another important thing is he was responsible for carrying on the lineage and carrying on the family's name. Excellent. Uh, Sister Nicole? Um, I don't know the correct term, but I don't know if it's irony or, but when you talk about Kingsman, it's crazy how Boaz is the Kingsman, the Redeemer, and Jesus comes from that lineage because he ends up coming from Jesse, which Jesse came from Ruth and Boaz. So I don't know if irony is the right word, but the correlation between being the Redeemer and Jesus being the Redeemer, it's in the Kingsman, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Beautiful point. Okay, so Sister um, uh, Amanda Brown, could you please read these for us? The kinsman redeemer is a male relative who, according to various laws of the Pentateuch, had the privilege or responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble, danger, or need. The Hebrew term goel for kinsman redeemer designates one who delivers or rescues or redeems property or person. So as we read this, think about Christ, the fulfillment of all this in Christ. The kinsman who redeems or vindicates a relative is illustrated most clearly in the book of Ruth, where the kinsman redeemer is Boaz. In the New Testament, Christ is often regarded as an example of a kinsman redeemer because as our brother, he also redeems us because of our great need one that only he can satisfy. Keep reading, please. In Ruth 3 and 9, we see a beautiful and poignant picture of a needy supplicant, unable to rescue herself, 
requesting of the kinsman redeemer that he cover her with his protection, redeem her and make her his wife. In the same way, the Lord Jesus Christ bought us for himself out of the curse, out of destitution, made us his own beloved bride and blessed us for all generations. He is the true kinsman redeemer of all who call on him in faith. Amen. Thank you, Sister Amanda. So the job of, of the kinsman redeemer was to redeem, to buy back, to buy out that which was lost by their relative, whether that be freedom, uh, their freedom or their property or their name. As someone said, they retained the name. I think Sister Shirley said that. So um, Sister Kawana, just read these last two verses and we're going to go right into the lesson, please. And he said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And thank you. And as Brother Sean was saying, we don't know, you know, um, with Boaz that, you know, he knew there was an era of kin. Um, she was younger and, you know, and but her reputation preceded her. You know, he had known of her. Um, but he said, fear not, my daughter, you know, I will do to thee all that thou requires. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And that's my prayer. Lord, I want to be a, a virtuous woman. You know, not when people are looking, but when people, you know, when I'm all by myself, you know, that you see me, Lord. So um, Boaz very much wanted to take on the role of kinsman redeemer for Ruth, but what was the roadblock? And it was said, but I just wanted to bring, highlight it again. What was the roadblock? I think Brother Sean said it. You want to come back and tell uh, Mother Miller, what was the roadblock? The man that's called, oh, such a one. <laughs> Amen. And, 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 I, and Bernie, I just want to read in Deuteronomy 25, it says, and it describes the man that did not want to marry the woman whose husband had died. Can I read that? Um, yes, we're going to, I will call you because I have a slide for that. And okay, Mother okay, Miller, I, will, okay. I will call you when um, we're going to read that. Okay, Perfect. okay, okay. Thank okay. You. Sister um, Sonia? Mother Millie basically said it. Okay. And it was so, the next in kin that was closer to he. Okay, perfect. And we're going to go right back there. So question number two, how soon, I wanted to um, bring this out too. How soon did Boaz begin the process of obtaining the right to become the kinsman redeemer for Ruth? How soon did he um, begin the process? The very next morning. He, he was a businessman. He had a lot going on, but he was moving quickly. You know, it's like what, what God was doing, there was no time to wait. You know, what God impressed upon him. And he was, I want to bring this out because he was a man of his word. In, in the previous verses, Kawana just read, he said, daughter, I, I, will, I, I will do this. You know, but he didn't wait a week. He, the very next morning, he got up right away and he was a man of his word. He was a man of integrity, you know, and I have to go back to this. A lot of, uh, I get Sister Amanda, um, sometimes, you know, men, they're getting ready to marry, get, they want a wife. Oh, I want a, a, a wife like Ruth. But at the same time, you know, a, a man should aim to be like Boaz. And 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 a, 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 a woman wants a Boaz and, and a Boaz wants a Ruth, but both of them have to be people of character. Both of them have to be people of integrity. But I love here how Boaz was a man of his word. He didn't wait and right away he jumped in on it and he didn't procrastinate. Sister Amanda. Uh, please unmute. Amanda Brown. Sorry, I just wanted to piggyback on what you were saying. Um, the part about how Boaz did it right away. It also shows that he was a man of authority because of his position in the gate of where he sat. 
um, and people actually heeded him when he spoke. That proves that he was also a man of integrity. And the other thing too, uh, this is not really talking about Boaz, but this is Naomi talking about Boaz. She told Ruth, you sit still and you wait and watch what God does for you, right? Because he's not going to let this not happen within a week. You know what I mean? So you know how God asks us to wait? Sometimes if we wait, you know, we get the blessing the way God wanted it, right? Instead of making a mess of it like I've done. But you get what I'm saying? The Lord through the Holy Ghost said to, through Naomi, you just sit here and wait. And this girl was obedient and boy, did the Lord bless her. Oh my goodness. Excellent point. And we're going to go right back there again, Sister Man, about, um, oh, go ahead, Carol Perdue. Sister Carol Perdue, you're, you want to say a comment? Okay. All right. So Sister Kawana, please read the lesson for us. We're talking about Boaz proposition verses one through six. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsmen of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsmen, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Amen. And we're going to unpack this a little bit. Um, but let's just ask this first question, though. And I want to go back to what Sister Amanda Brown just said. Why did Boaz go to the city gate? And what did he do after he arrived there? Question number two. Elder Leroy. The, the city gate would be where the elders, where they sit. It's almost like uh, open courts. You know, and there's some places in Africa that's where they have it. The elders and the the, the um village chief that would sit in the open and people would come and present their case so the city gate was where everyone passed through and that was where the, the honorable men and possible women would meet to discuss issues and to decide on, on a case so that's where um he went amen anybody else you know we read stories of the bible i think about um lot in sodom we find him at this city gate a lot of important legal matters were um uh, uh, discussed at the, the city gate and, and there he summoned witnesses, you know, at the city gates. But what Sister Amanda said, I wanted to bring us back to that point. At the city gate, you could tell Boaz was a man of integrity, a man of influence, a man of authority. Because what the Bible says, that he summoned 10 elders not 10 little boys not 10 little girls but 10 elders elders of the city for them to come at the request of boaz it lets you know his character and in the bible it says how um i think in the new testament that it took 10 men to uh, if you have uh, a 10 men in the city you can uh, open a synagogue you know so 10 was a, a good number you know so for him to have 10 um uh elders there was commendable for him it it spoke of his character i thought that was so powerful any any comment with that so any uh sister shirley williams they were also uh considered as witnesses to what boaz was about to say excellent and that's a good point too, Sister Shirley. They were witnesses about what he's about to say. And the other point I wanted to, to bring out, as I said, you know, I'm a woman and I'm teaching the, the lessons so I could take certain liberties. <laughs> but Boaz wanted everybody to see what was going on. 
he wasn't hiding it. He wasn't doing it in the corner. He wasn't doing it after hours, you know, and men of integrity, you know, you want to do things. You don't want to drive by when it's dark and no, but he wanted everything out in the open. He went by the law. You know, you could see he's a man of character. And even in when he found um, Ruth at his feet, he didn't defile her. You know, um, when he woke up and she was at his feet, he didn't try to defile her. So you could see his character. And um, any any comments? I don't want to do all the talking tonight. Uh, Sister Cherie. I, I just love it because it, it showed how much he cared that he wanted to make sure it was sealed. He wanted to make sure it was done correctly. You know, he could have did it half, half his hands or any old way and it could have been, you know, reversed, but he wanted to make sure it was set in stone that Ruth was taken care of because he truly cared because he saw, like he said, um, it said in scripture that she could have came to a younger man and she went to somebody like him. So he was honored from that, that she showed him her character so he wanted to show her that i'm truly going to take care of you amen amen you know he didn't drive her after hours and tell him to take care of you, but i don't want nobody to know he wanted to do it according to the law and not in a secret corner <laughs> powerful thank you for your comments sister kawana and sister amanda yeah just um piggybacking off the off of sister sheree and just how Boaz's character is just unfolding and I'm, I'm sure, you know, Ruth is kind of getting to know him and looking at this and looking at this and um, and how we say, you know, we have to always think of Christ in this and just like the parallels. I'm sure Ruth is like falling in love with him more and more and more as she sees his character unfold, as she sees the great way that he's handling things. And I, I think I'm thinking of it like with, with, with us, with God, right? Like when we first come to him, we love him, but as we get to know him more and more and more and more, we fall in love more and more and more with him. So that song, like falling in love with Jesus, is keeps just playing in my head with all this, like playing in my head. Cause I, I just think of Ruth looking at Boaz and like, wow, I'm like falling in love with him and like how we are with, you know, with, with our relationship with God. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful comment. And ultimately, Sister Kawana, this is where we should end up with the lesson, you know, um, amen. Uh, Sister Amanda and Mother Millie. So I wanted to follow up on where Kiwana was going with the Christ part, because like you were saying in the beginning that the Lord gave us foreshadows of what he was going to do. And this is exactly what he did with Boaz and Ruth. He, when he wants to save us, he doesn't save us in a corner, mm. he saves us in, in the sight of everybody. And then he does all these great things in our life to show us off of his goodness in our life. Like he wanted everybody in the whole town. Like, you know, he wanted Boaz to preach the word of God of love, the love that God has for his beloved bride. He didn't take advantage of us when we were already wretched and dirty. He didn't make us feel worse and beat us down to the ground or, you know, like Satan does just, you know, roll over your back like the scripture says. Christ comes, he's like, Noah, I'm gonna cover your mess. I'm gonna take your debt. And then I'm going to lift you up into a position of, of wholeness and make you beautified. And you know what? You don't diminish me. Anything that or how wicked you are, there's no diminishing of me. I have so much goodness. I'm just going to lavish it on you so you could be wonderful like me. So beautiful. What a beautiful comment. My goodness. Mother Millie? Ma, I just want to tell the young women that are waiting to know their worth and not to settle because it's not the timing of the young ladies. It's the timing. God is trying to put character in the young women so they could notice the ones that are, that have character that Boaz has and not just to pick somebody because the time and it's ticking. Beautiful comment, Mother Millie. I'm telling you, the older women teach the young women, my goodness, how to be chased. That's beautiful. Thank you. So um, question number three, what was Boaz's initial proposal to the other kinsmen? Question number three. Someone we have not heard from? What was his initial proposal? Well, Boaz explained the situation to the unnamed kingsman. 
saying that since he was a closer relative than Boaz, he had the first right to redeem the land. And we're going to read um, Leviticus 25. I think Sister um, Sharon alluded to this. Um, real quick comment, Sister Amanda and Sister Shirley. Thank you, Sister Bernadette. This will be my last comment. No, no, don't let it be your last comment. <laughs> um, but when I was thinking about this, so I, I work with lawyers and there's this thing called first right of refusal, right? And you have, when you have something and somebody has a position ahead of you, they have to refuse it first for it to be able for others to take it. Mm -hmm. But what Boaz did, and this is where I saw the wisdom of God, is he offered up the least desirable portion of the inheritance first. He said, hey, do you want this 10-year-old barren land that's not been held or managed by Elimelech or his sons? And the guy's like, oh, yeah, I'm in. And then Boaz goes on to say, but don't forget, you have to do this, too. And that, too, meant that he wasn't just trying to show everybody that he wanted Ruth. He kept mm -hmm. it all discreet. So he was like a master contract writer, if you will. Like he gave him the carrot but then he beat him back with the stick. You know what I mean? So I just say like, I really do love this story. Sorry. Amen. Don't let it be your last comment because uh, your, your comments are so powerful. Um, I love this. I too, Sister Amanda, I thought about my own boss because he can, he's a great neg negotiator. Because if you read this story, some people say, well, he was being deceptive. No, he wasn't being deceptive. He was negotiating, you know, and I love what Amanda saying coming from a legal standpoint. So I really believe that was what's going on. He was negotiating the land and my, my, um, my boss, he's a great negotiator. I am telling you, I, I see why he ended up with 80 something stores in such a short time, you know, so God has blessed him. So it takes a real talent um, to do this, but sister um, Kawana, please read this for us. The land shall not be sold forever. For the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And, you know, we, as Sister Sharon was talking about the Levitical law, we don't have time to go into it. Like I said, this lesson is so powerful. But if it's not, you know, whoever has it on the day of the 50th year of Jubilee has to return um, back to the owner. But even as Sister Sh Shirley was saying that, you know, they, uh, Israel, they had to, uh, it was important that they retain the family name. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that was talking about dividing up uh, Jerusalem. The, the, Jerusalem belongs to the Lord. I just want to um, go off a little bit. Jerusalem is the Lord's land and it cannot be divided up or, or sold. That's his land, you know, and he's, his eyes are always open, uh, um, you know, looking at that piece of land. But that's why you never really, you know, you can't really sell your land to strangers. He had to stay in the family and at the 50th year to return back to the family because of the family name. So we're moving along. It's so rich and my goodness, I don't want to run out of time. But how did Boaz make certain the other king's kinsmen understood that it was a legal transaction? And I think it, this was said, Boaz made it certain that th this relative understood that a legal transaction was taking place and he referred to the witnesses he had gathered for this occasion. By it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people and that Ruth four and four. And back then they did, you know, now you have all these le legal things. You have, um, you know, I think about Sister Jolene even, you know, was helping my mother after my dad died. And you have, you have to go to city hall and you get all these, I don't know, all these legal terms and, you know, uh, um, they didn't have all this, you know, they had word of mouth and they had witnesses, <laughs> you know, all these legal documents, you know, signing this and signing that and you know, power of attorney. And, you know, so back then they had any, you know, they were witnesses and he had 10 of them, 10 elders, reputable men who would remember that this transaction took place, you know, five years down the road to say, oh, no, I was there. And it was a legal transaction. Any comments? No comments? Oh, okay. 
So question five, what additional fact did Boaz explain that caused the kinsman to rescind his offer to redeem no Naomi's land? And I think we talked about it, but let's um, just repeat what was said. Number five, who'd like to answer number five? What additional facts, Sister Shirley? So yeah, he told the um he told the, the relative that he, if he bought the land, he would also have to get Ruth along. I mean, yes, he would have to get um, Ruth along with it. Mm -hmm. So um so the, he decided that he didn't want to mar his own um inheritance, so he refused it. Very good, um, Sister Shirley Wan Williams. Would you like to add to that? Well, not only that, he had to marry Ruth and take care of Naomi. Uh, that was a part of the proposition. He gave uh, the, the nearest kinsman a time to think about it. And um, after he had said about Ruth and Naomi, that's when he was like, uh, you know, never mind. You know, I don't have that ability to take care of um, that. And like Shirley had said, to mar him, which meant he didn't want to damage his own estate. Good, Shirley. Good, Sister Shirley. That was my next question. I guess, Sister Merle, I was wondering, the this, this scripture doesn't state, but I was going to ask your opinion. Why do you think you rescinded? Um, but that was very good, Sister Shirley. Thank you. Um, Sister Merle? I was just going to kind of add to it because when he married Ruth, I think if Ruth had have had children, like that land that he was kind was getting, that land in reality would have to stay under Elimelech's name through Ruth somehow. So it was like he was getting the land, but it's almost like he wasn't getting the land, if that makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. And then um, I think as Sister Shirley was saying, you know, he didn't want to mar his family name who knows it didn't say if this man had a wife before it doesn't say if this man had children you know we just says unnamed man so we don't know the status of this man why he re he didn't he rejected this offer but if you notice his name he was unnamed and from reading the background what it was saying was what he did was an insult you know and we're going to read this the scripture but you know what he did was an insult and that's why he was unnamed and you know it, 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 nothing else was said about him he didn't even have a name because what he did was not nice for, from what the jewish customs uh said sister sheree, did i call a hand before sister sheree sister sheree and sister amanda davis i was kind of thinking like sister Shirley about marring his name and i was like maybe he was thinking i can't do this because this is a mobite woman and, you know, she would bring shame upon my name and, you know, I, I just couldn't do it. And then I also, this is the first time I really looked at more of a spiritual aspect of the story. And I was like, I said to myself, well, thank God he turned her down this, like we, people may turn us down before we got to Christ, but then Christ came and he loved us and redeemed us. So I just thought that was awesome that man may not accept you but christ is gonna accept you he's like the best love, lover that you ever have would be jesus you know i'm a widow and yes i still believe that god has somebody out there for me i haven't been ha haven't found that kingsman redeemer but i can truly say that jesus is the best lover that i've ever had he has not, he's taken care of me he's done everything that a husband should do until as i wait being it almost 60, 59, 39, 60, I still believe that God has Kingsman Redeemer for us women in our 50s and our 60s and our 70s if we want that. I just want to also say that. Amen. I believe God too, Sister Cherie. Amen. But, um, you know, I was listening to Sister Cherie and this whole, I think Pastor B brought this point out last week. It never talked about her beauty. And all of scriptures, like it talks about how Sarah and, and Rachel, it highlights their beauty. But here it never did because God wants us to focus on her character. You know, who knows? I don't know if she was beautiful. I'm thinking Moabite, she might have been. You know, I'm assuming she was beautiful, but this story highlights her character versus her external. 
So that's very important. We have to go back to that system, Amanda Davis. Um, in addition to all of those really good points, I was just going to say that um, taking her in as wife, it takes a lot of sacrifice. Like he had to pay the price. Um, so I just feel like he's like, I could just think about it nowadays, like a man today, like, oh, no, that's that's too much. I can't. Amen. It, it's true. And what you're saying, Sister Amanda, there were some stipulations and we're going to um, kind of close out with that, with the kinsman redeemer um, and that we're going to relate it to Christ. But um, I don't remember who said this, but one of them, um, you had to be able to do it financially. And another one, you had to um, be in line to do it. And another stipulation was you had to be willing. So I think Sister Shirley brought out the point. He wasn't willing to do it. You know, he might have had the financial means, but he wasn't willing to do it. And this is how we're going to relate this to Christ, Christ's willingness to redeem us. Amen. Sister Amanda? Yeah, I was just going to say that. Let's say that um, he didn't want to do it, but he just went forward with it it wouldn't have worked. So I'm really glad that he said no, that he, you know, he backed out of it, even though he looked crazy. Um, it's best that he did that because his heart wouldn't have been in the right place. Amen. Amen. Beautiful point. So um, Boaz uh, linked Ruth with Naomi and explained that if the kinsman redeemed the property from Naomi, he would also have to buy it from Ruth and take her as his wife in order to perpetuate Elimelech's name. And he didn't want that. He wanted his own name, you know? And, um, you know, that's that's another story. We, we, you know, people sometimes want their own name, but it's all about Christ. It's all about God's will, you know, no longer our will, but thy will be done, Lord. Um, Sister um, Kawana, and this is Mother Millie, this is where you, you were going, and I'll have you make your comment after Sister um, Kawana reads this, these verses, please. If brethren, if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. Amen. Mother Millie, would you like to make your comment now? Yes, please. Yes. In, Deut in, yes. Deuteron in Deuteronomy 25 and 7, 25 and 7, it says, and if a man like not to take his brother's wife, then let the brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to rise up unto his brother's a name in Israel, and he will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall say, so shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. Hey. And, his oh, sorry, and, his sorry. and his name shall be called in Israel the home, the house of him that has his shoe loosened. So we don't want any sh loosened shoes in the church in the name of Jesus. Amen, Mother Billy. And she shall spit in his face. This is what I'm saying. For him to say no, and you know, we don't hear this story, you know, of anybody spitting in his face. But like I, I know um, Ju uh, the story of Judah, Judah's son. Um, I think um, Mary and Tamar and one died and the other brother should have married, but he, he, the Bible said he spilled his seed and God killed him, you know, because it was a big thing to carry on the family's name, you know, and that's why Tamar and the younger brother was too young and Tamar deceived, um, I may be mixing up the stories, but anyway, to, um, Tamar um, 
dece um, camouflaged herself and went into Judah, you know, and produced a seed. But it was a disgrace to refuse to bring up your brother's child, you know. We don't know why, um, we're gonna get Sister Shirley, we don't know why this kinsman rescinded, but maybe he feared, as we said, that he's, his, in, his inheritance, sorry, would be um, lessened for his own children. What originally seemed to be a financial benefit to him now appeared to be a liability instead. He not only claimed he could not do it, but also told Boaz that he could proceed with redeeming it himself. Sister Shirley? You actually said what I was about to do. Uh, I was going to say the other kinsmen did see it as a financial gain some, of some property that he could probably build on. And whereas Boaz saw it in loving kindness, his heart was more involved in it. Amen. And his heart was for um, Ruth and Naomi, even to please Naomi. And we don't know at what point this property was sold. We don't know if Emelech sold it before he went to Moab. We don't know. All we know is it was sold and Naomi and Ruth couldn't physically glean, you know, take care of the property, the upkeep of it. So um, it had to be, um, you know, it was sold. Um, Sister Nicole? Um, I just wanted to add a point that especially for the singles, sometimes we look at rejection as a bad thing. But in this case, rejection turned out to be a good thing in Naomi's favor because Boaz really loved her. And had she went with um, the other guy, like you said, it would have been for money. He wouldn't have loved her. He wouldn't have cared for her. And in marriage, so sometimes being rejected is a good thing because God's blocking you from all the heartache and the pain that she could have went through had she went with the other guy. Amen. And you remember what Boaz said, I heard about your reputation, how you're a virtuous woman. So he loved her character, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, in the Bible, you married somebody and then you grew to love them after. And I believe that's what happened with, with Boaz. You know, he loved the person she was and then even you know grew to love her intimately that's what i'm surmising so sister kawana please read this my goodness is so much in this lesson i and we're running out of time my goodness uh ruth 4 7 through 10. i love all your comments uh boaz acquisition now this was the manner in former time in israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing for to confirm all things a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore, the kinsman said unto Boaz, buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. But he didn't know spitting going on, Mother Millie. <laughs> you know, they, they, I guess they weren't, you know, times fast. <laughs> and Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. Amen. Thank you. And then in this verse, this is where we find who Ruth was married to, Malon. Um, how was this the transaction sealed? Let's just do this real quickly because we, we're running out of time. How was the transaction sealed? It was said. Sister Shirley? It was sealed by him taking off his sandal uh, openly in front of everyone. Very good. Brother Ashton, you want to add? No, she said it. Okay, taking off Thank his you. sandals, yes. And, um, you know, I, I think about where, you know, the the sandals, you know, um, yeah, let's answer the next question and then I'll make my comment. What did this action mean? Sister Carol Perdue. Uh, what Unmute. it meant that, mm -hmm. um, can you hear me, Sister Brin? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yes, what it meant that um, by removing the sandal, it was a confirmation of what took to, what taking place and what happened that the um, Boaz at this point was uh, transferred the right of ownership, so it was like he could walk and walk on the um, walk on the on the new property freely, and this way made him uh, to see in the eyes of the people that he 
um, was was the owner of originally officially of the property as well as roof. Amen. Excellent. Thank you, Sister Carol. As she said, ownership was transferred and he had relinquished all rights to the property. By handing over the shoe, the close relative was symbol, uh, symbolically handing over his right to walk on the land that was being sold. And I thought about the word the Bible says to, you know, Joshua, Joshua, wherever your soles or your feet shall walk, tread upon shall be yours. You know, so that's the shoe, um, you know, you're transferring it and that's what it represents. So what were the two transactions that took place that day? Um, we just covered it, just summarize it. Sister Shirley. Oh, uh, he sold the property and mm -hmm. he married Ruth. Yes, those are the two, to the transaction of ownership of the property and the acquisition of Ruth as Boab's wife. In verse 10, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to bring this point out real quick because um, Sister um, Alma brought it out last week. I thought it was so powerful. It just, it just stayed with me. Um, in verse 10, for the first time, we learned that Ruth had been married to Malon. And Sister Alma last week brought out the point that his name means sickly. And, um, and, uh, at this, and Boaz means strength. So she went from being, um, being, you know, being married to sickly to being married to strength. And God turned her captivity. That's what I saw, Sister Alma, in this. When the Lord turned again your captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. God had elevated her to a new place. You know, all the toil and the turmoil and all that she went through in the land of Moab and the sickness and the hard times, God was turning her captivity and giving her new strength and new vitality and a new place in him. And that's how, as Sister Amanda Brown would say, that's how God strengthened us, you know, takes our bad and make it good. And we're new creatures in Christ. Amen. So thank you, Sister Alma, for bringing out that point last week. I thought it was so powerful. We don't have time really to linger there. Um, how did Boaz reiterate to the witnesses? I'm sorry. Sister Carol do you want to make a point? Yes, I just thought about something we used to say years ago. Um, as as we're going through this lesson on Ruth, it's like um, God does not disappoint the desires of his own making. So it was in his master plan, his divine appointment, for everything to line up just as it did. And it's amazing how when you just walk in obedience, how God fulfilled the promise that he has made and did not necessarily always make to them because they didn't really have any idea to the extent of what God was working. Perhaps not realize that God was working behind the scene, but... And do, in the process of time, he put the desire in Boaz's heart. I look, I feel this way, as well as as Ruth, to where at the right time that they all would come together. So it was just a beautiful plan that he had, and he just brought it to fruition. So I was just inspired by that too. Amen, Sister Purdue. And I want to add to your comments. It's a beautiful comment. I remember. Um, I think Sister Kawana brought this point out last week when she was teaching how. When Ruth, because she was obedient to Naomi, her she wanted to help her mother-in-law, the spirit she had, the love she had for her mother-in-law when she, when she went to glean. It happened to be Boaz's um, farm. You know, and just what you're saying, Kara Purdue, there is no happenstance with God. There are no coincidences with God that she ended up at Boaz's field. God orchestrated that. Everything was like a puzzle. You know, we're, we like, even where we are, where we are right now, you know, even in our spiritual walk in your own personal place with the Lord, it, it, where you are now, it doesn't surprise God. God knew where you would be. You know, you may be surprised in the place you are, but it didn't surprise God. So he's orchestrating our lives and all he wants us to do as we started in the beginning, just have obedient trust and obedient faith. It's not always easy. The flesh wants to do other things, but God just wants us to trust him. I heard Sister Angel say this years ago that we love God, but we don't really trust him. And so this is my prayer. Lord, help me to trust you and to relinquish 
relinquish all my fears and all my anxieties as Pastor B preached on, on um, Sunday that the Lord, he's a sustainer. Amen. So Boaz would be continuing the name of those in his, uh, oh, number nine. How did Boaz reiterate to the witness wi witnessing elders that what they had seen was important? And I'll just say that quickly because I want to hit a couple of things. Boaz would be continuing the name of those in his family who had died. It was significant in that culture that a family name not be broken off. And we already said that. In reiterating this to the witnessing elders, Boaz, Boaz confirmed the importance of the actions he had taken that day and the importance of their witness. Number 10, what was the response of those witnessing this event? What was the response of the people? Uh, Sister Titi. Uh, it, um, they all rejoiced together mm -hmm. and they were eager to claim that they had witnessed the transaction that day. Amen. What else did they do? They rejoice. And what else did they do? Okay, the people, uh, I'll just say this the people gathered uh, to okay. today. What else did they do? T uh, T -T, I'm sorry. They, um, they, they, uh, they was rejoiced, but all of them were equal to acclaim what they had witnessed that day. Did I say that right? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I twisted to... it up, but I, yeah. The people gathered in the gate of Bethlehem along with the witnessing elders and they all rejoice together. The people, I wanted to add this, the people prayed, they put a blessing upon their, uh, Ruth. The people prayed that Ruth would be fruitful in bearing children. They pronounced a blessing that she would be fruitful, listen to this, that she would be fruitful and famous and bring honor to their little town and Oh, did she do that? Amen. A commentator said, what wonderful changes came into Ruth's life because she trusted Boaz and let him work on her behalf. She went from loneliness to love, from toil to rest, from poverty to wealth, from worry to assurance, and from despair to hope. She was no longer Ruth the Moabitess, for the past was gone, Sister Amanda. Think of us, our past was gone and she was making a new, sorry, she was making a new beginning. She was now Ruth, the wife of Boaz, a name she was proud to bear. What a beautiful story. After the marriage, God poured out his grace on Ruth and Boaz by giving them a son, as we saw it in the, the clip, the video clip and gave her son, whom they named Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. And from David, thousand years later, would be Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. So as we're wrapping this up, seeing Christ in the book of Ruth, this is what the book is all about seeing Christ in the book of Ruth. Every page we read of the holy sacred text really is about Christ. The concept of the kinsman redeemer of Goel near Kingsman is an important portrayal of the work of Christ. The Goel must be, it's another name for Kingsman, must be a kin, the same kind. And I, I thought about this and I said, this is why Jesus became man, became one of us, that he could be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And um, Hebrews 2 and 11 says, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He became one of us. He could be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He, the, 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 the kingsman redeemer couldn't redeem if he wasn't a kin if he wasn't one of them, if he didn't have the blood connection. The second thing, he must be able to pay the price of redemption. And the unknown redeemer, the unknown kingsman, he was able to pay it in full. He must be willing, but he wasn't willing to redeem. So this is the, the true kingsman redeemer had to meet all these criteria. He must be willing to redeem as Sister uh, Amanda uh, Davis brought out. He must be free himself. Christ was free from the curse of sin. He wasn't sold into you know, slavery. He had to be free himself to 
free us from sin. The Hebrew term goel appearing many times in the short book presents a clear picture of the mediating work of Christ. There is so much. Um, but being willing, I wanted to say how willing Jesus was. The scripture in Hebrews, um, I think, uh, 12, Hebrews 12 and 1, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He was so willing to set us free, and he was able, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Thank you, Jesus. So things to ponder. Any comments real quick before we do our final slides? Any thoughts, any comments? Okay, thoughts to ponder. Reflect on the love and kindness that Ruth showed to Naomi in providing for her after the loss of her husband and her two sons. These are the things we should, the takeaways that we should leave, the, take out the book of, um, take, I'm sorry, take from the book of Ruth. These are the takeaways. Reflect on the love and kindness that Ruth showed to Naomi in providing for her after the loss of her husband and her two sons. It was so commendable. That's why God blessed her. The kindness that she showed um, Naomi was so commendable. Lord, help us. You know, to even be so tender with the older generation. I even think about my mother and I pray, Lord, just give me the patience and the, the tenderness, you know, to care for her. Consider the kindness that Boaz showed to Ruth and even taking on the duty of the family redeemer that when the closest relative declined the privilege to do so. Amen. We've got to consider that even when the closest relative declined to do so. He said, yes. Also, let us remember how God showed such grace to these people, bringing them from tragedy and hardship to a glorious ending because they trusted him and followed his laws in a time of moral depravity. God blessed them in putting their names in the lineage that would bring forth the Messiah, our Lord Jesus. And I thought about the, um, I think Shirley Williams brought this point out, that the unnamed kinsman redeemer, he didn't want to mar his name. He said, no, he didn't want to mar his name. And guess what? We don't even know his name. He's forgotten. But because Boaz said yes, my goodness, God bless them. There is a blessing in saying yes to the will of God. They prayed over Ruth that her name will be famous, and God did just what they said. But because Boaz said yes, God blessed them in putting their names in the lineage that would bring forth the Messiah, our Lord Jesus. He blesses us abundantly, exceedingly abundantly, more than we could, more than we can ask or even think. There's when Boaz said yes, he had no idea. To be in the lineage of Christ in, in the book of Matthew. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful thing. C closing the case. Boaz had fallen in love with a pure outsider to Israel and decided to make her his own. He did what he needed to do, making it legal by having witnesses to the transaction. What a wonderful picture of Christ loving us, Sister Amanda Brown, and then setting out to pay the redemption price in order to acquire a bride. Oh, how he cares for us. There's something I want to read real quick. This is an incredible foreshadowing of Christ, our kinsman redeemer, who has met all the requirements. I said there were stipulations, but Christ met all the requirements. Who has willingly left the glorious, the glories of heaven to become our kind. Not only was he able to redeem us by being that perfect sinless sacrifice, but he paid the redemption price in full with his own blood and that old rugged cross. When he said, it is finished, he paid the price. We were without hope, we were lost, we were destitute, but God, 
He has lavished us with his love and kindness and brought us with his and bought us with his blood and has welcomed us into his family. Amen, amen, amen. And anticipating the next lesson. Next week is a glorious lesson taught by Hannah. She's one of my favorite Bible characters. We will study Hannah's prayer after God blesses her with Samuel as her son. Please read it coming from 1 Samuel 1 and 2. Amen. God bless you. God now unto him who's able, he's able to keep you from falling. Thank you for your participation. God bless you. We love you. Now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and ever. Amen. And I know that messed them up, but I messed it up. But God bless you. And I love you. And thank you for joining us. Amen. <laughs>